so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Haskell at Target. Um, now, amusingly, I've mentioned that I work at Target a few times, and people have asked me, what is Target? Um, so I, I, I think the reason people ask this is because they don't accept Target to be the sort of place that uses Haskell or does investment optimization. But ultimately, Target is a retailer. And we run about 1,800 stores across the, uh, across the United States. And we have a supply chain with 37 distribution centers serving all of these stores and also serving Target.com which is a, a smaller operation in the stores, but growing really quickly. Turn out to be quite different. 
So the entire stochastic optimization problem and kind of the entire problem we're solving at Haskell falls into this uh, very common mathematical framework called a Markov decision process. And the idea behind the Markov decision process is that we model our system as a set of possible states and the set of possible actions we can do. And of course, the difficulty is that when we have the world and we do something, it's going to react in some random, random way. So while we do have some kind of model that predicts what happens, this model is necessarily probabilistic. And so we have a transition probability. So given some starting state and given an action that we take, we have some random results drawn from some complex probabilistic model. And then finally, as part of the system, we also get rewards as we go along. So in the case of supply chain optimization, these, these rewards um, correspond to sort of costs and profits from moving and selling items. And I'll sort of demonstrate this with both some Haskell code and some more concrete examples later. So don't worry if it sounds abstract. Um, so one important thing to realize, and I think this is what really makes stochastic optimization different from normal optimization, is that we don't ever just get a single number out, and we don't ever just get a single list of things to do out. Instead, we get something called a policy. Because we never know step to step what state we will end up in, thanks to all the randomness, we actually have to optimize and figure out the optimal thing to do from every single possible state. So the result of the optimization, the thing we're optimizing, is actually a function itself. And this is the function that uh, we, we then actually run to make decisions as we execute the results of our optimization. And one thing I really liked about this framework is that it's actually used in a wide range of places. The first time I learned about it was in an AI class where the same framework is used for things like robotics motion planning. And what you do there is you do some complex offline optimization and then produce a function that tells the robot how to react to the outside world. So the robot, the agent you're letting go into the world, can be substantially simpler and do substantially less computation in order to act optimally based on this offline planning. And of course, one thing I kind of like to think about is in a very real sense, we are kind of doing offline planning for robotics, except our robot is made up of 37 distribution centers, 1,800 stores, and probably a couple hundred thousand people. Okay, so what techniques do we use for stochastic optimization? As it happens, it breaks down into a few very general techniques. So one of them is called dynamic programming. Now, coming from computer science, this sounds a little bit weird, but dynamic programming was actually originally invented in operations research in order to solve this exact kind of problem. And in the operations research world, when people say dynamic programming, they don't mean the general technique to design algorithms. They mean a specific set of algorithms for optimizing market decision processes. And if you've ever read the history behind the name, it was chosen purely for uh, marketing grounds because the, you know, the, the, the person who invented it wanted to make sure to get funding from his parent corporation and came up with a name that nobody could deny. Um, and that also explains why, if you think about the two words together, they make no sense. So another technique is linear programming. Now, this kind of overlaps with the sort of optimization people imagine, but the difference is that to get to a linear program, which is just a set of linear equations, requires a, an additional sort of compilation step that expresses our Markov decision process as a set of linear equations. And both of these methods are exact, so they can actually give us provably optimal solutions. And of course, this means that they don't scale to anything even remotely realistic. Now, of course, if you really try to optimize everything with everything being able, being able to influence everything else, uh, the, the problem just really quickly becomes completely intractable. We did some back of the envelope calculations to see in a perfect world what it would take to just optimize basically every single item moving through every single node of the target network with all the additional possible constraints we could think of. And we came up with uh, a function that would generate something on the order of, few, of, of a few billion linear variables, which is uh, hilariously, hilariously impractical. And it's not even a matter of Moore's law. It's just we'll never be able to solve that exactly. Luckily, there are a few different approaches to uh, approximating these things. And a really common one that's gotten a lot of press in the last couple of years is reinforcement learning. And in fact, again, in the operations research community, uh, reinforcement learning sometimes known as approximate dynamic programming, because what it does is it approximates 
dynamic programming, where dynamic programming is this specific uh, set of algorithms. And then when you do reinforcement learning, there's also some additional uh, approximations you can make to solve the system faster. And then on top of this, there are, of course, lots of domain-specific algorithms where you have operations research papers that just solve a specific problem exactly or a specific problem with a good bound, letting you apply them to actually, you know, particular business problems. And so our goal with Haskell is to provide a framework where we can express all these different solution methods. And we can talk both about the general methods, the more approximate methods, and the domain-specific ones in a way that has as many reusable pieces as possible and gives us the tools we need to make sure that our models are correct and that they actually model what we think they model. Now, I think I'll start by just sort of sketching out how you start this with a type for Markov decision processes. Now, this isn't exactly the same as I described, but basically the idea is that the Markov decision process has a set of states, which is the type S. It has a set of actions, which is the type A. And that if you have a state and you have an action and you do something, the result is some kind of random distribution with a reward and a new state. And we can capture the whole thing in a single new type as a function. And one thing to note here is the N. So I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. But the idea is that probability distributions form a monad. And in fact, they form multiple interesting monads. So throughout our code, we always write it sort of generic against any kind of distribution monad, giving us different ways to understand and evaluate the code. And then finally, a policy is just a function from states to actions. Now, another thing that we want to do to understand how our optimized systems actually behave and to sort of sanity check the things we produce is to run our systems in simulation. And one of the neat things is that if you have a markup decision process and then you found a policy of some sort, whether it's optimal or not, you can always apply that policy to the process and just get an old fashioned markup chain out. And in fact, if you sort of look at the types, what happens is that, just go back, here we have a function that takes states and actions. And then here, sorry, we have a function that takes states and actions. And then we have another function, the policy, which tells us what actions do for every state. So essentially all we do to create the Markov chain is at each step, we look at the state and instead of allowing you to choose any action, we choose the one prescribed specifically by the policy. And that kind of simulation is what we use to understand the kind of more realistic behavior of the system before we actually deploy it to physical products and physical distribution centers. Okay, so one of the things that turned out to be incredibly useful from the Haskell world is the probability monad. Well, I say the probability monad. There's kind of abstractly a single one in the sense that probability distributions semantically form a monad in a, a nice way. But in practice, we also tend to interpret it in different ways. So a monad, I find it easier to think about it in terms of sort of return and join, where join is the flattening operation. And you can always get the Haskell bind operation by uh, combining join and fmap. Uh, so basically, in the case of probability, return just gives us a constant probability. So it gives us the probability of a specific event uh, that always happens, probability one. And then join, and this one's a little bit confusing at first, kind of like for a lot of monads, Join lets us take a distribution of distributions and flatten that into a single, single distribution. And one way to think about this is that we first sample to get a concrete distribution out, and then we sample that distribution to get our final sample. Another way to think about it is that we take the whole distribution of distributions, and then we sort of flatten it and multiply out all of the probabilities to get all of the possible final results. Now, this is a little bit abstract by itself, so here's a little example of how you might use this. And this, this particular example is kind of contrived. So the idea is that we have a, a coin and we start with a fair coin. And then depending on the result of the fair coin, we either flip another fair coin or we flip a coin that's heavily biased. And this single expression here, biased, represents the sequence of two actions where the randomness of the second action depends on the first. And again, one way to interpret this is that we take the entire possible distribution for the first coin, and then we take both possible distributions for each event, and then finally we combine them by multiplying, multiplying them out. But another way to think about it is simply in terms of random sampling. And the nice thing is, based on the semantics here, you can think about it either way, and it's still going to do the behavior you expect. 
Um, and so here are just two, two examples of how we actually translate this, one of which being just using an explicit list of probability value pairs, and the other one being some kind of pseudo-random number generator. So if you've ever played with Monad random, this is exactly what's going on. And then one thing that's gotten me very excited, but we haven't yet implemented yet, is this recent paper which describes how to extend this approach to more kinds of distributions, and more importantly, apply sort of cutting edge state-of-the-art probabilistic programming algorithms. So realistically, with a bit of work, we can get a full probabilistic programming language with, uh, that, that's actually based on their benchmarks, comparable to dedicated probabilistic programming language that people are using now, embedded in Haskell with a relatively straightforward interface. So for people working in fields that involve a lot of probability, I think this is very exciting and a good reason to use, use Haskell. Um, and so here, I won't go through the details, but this is kind of a, a, a sketch of what this style lets us do to express, um, to express systems that correspond, you know, supply chain systems. And basically the idea is that we can write a program that sort of reads very linearly, but it's actually interpreted probabilistically. And this makes life a lot easier when developing and testing different variations on the same randomized scenario, which happens a lot in our supply chain optimization. Okay, so an actual question that, that people ask a lot is, why did we choose Haskell for this? And I mean, I'm kind of the wrong person to ask because I, you know, I'm the person who always asks, why not Haskell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are actually some concrete reasons that, uh, that we like. And of course, one of the biggest ones as ever is types. And as I mentioned, one of our goals is to create a framework that lets us express these models, and lets us express models in a way that's modular and reusable and easy to reason about. And types play a big role in creating the abstractions we need to break these uh, stochastic systems up and to sort of help people combine pieces in ways that are correct. But types also help with a lot of relatively boring things. Um, a very common case in supply chain optimization is that we're limited to sending individual items, and then other times we have to send cases of items, and then other times we have to send bigger cases of items. And one of you know, the common mistakes people make that takes a while to debug is you know, using a case when you needed a quantity of individual items, or you know, using a number of individual items when you actually care about the number of cases. Types are the perfect thing to just completely preclude that sort of problem before you even go to debug your code. So another thing that I love about Haskell is that it makes it very easy to embed lightweight domain-specific languages. So kind of the probability examples, and all it took was this kind of probability monad, they already let us embed this lightweight probabilistic language right in Haskell. So we don't have to reach for a heavy tool with its own syntax, its own semantics, and its own compiler. Instead, we can write normal Haskell and just have components that behave probabilistically. And this, of course, really helps us scale the uh, breadth of models that we can work on because we can have multiple domain specific languages that correspond to lower level uh, parts of our system, like for example, generating linear programs, and also higher level ones that correspond to domain problems and correspond to stochastic optimization. Now, the kind of the genesis of this work, oddly enough, comes from a paper that was published back in 2000 called Composing Contracts. And I don't think this paper was ever super influential in the sort of programming research world, but it actually had a lot of reach in the finance world. So what this paper described was a simple combinator-based language for describing derivatives contracts. It turned out that all these really complex derivatives that banks were building and selling to uh, sophisticated clients could often be expressed as a combination of a small number of primitive operations. And so the person who originally started this project at Target had worked with systems inspired by this paper at some of the um, sort of major investment banks. Now, those systems made it a lot easier to model contracts, to understand contracts, and to integrate contracts into the rest of the bank system than the previous state of the art, which was basically a whole bunch of ad hoc Excel managed by uh, individual bankers and sort of shared by email. Which, by the way, is still how maybe 80% of the finance world runs, uh, in case you don't wanna, you know, in case you feel too confident in your money. <laughs> and so for us, again, part of the goal is to create a similar framework to talk about stochastic optimization problems and, and similarly help people write reusable pieces and 
apply ideas from programming languages and just from uh, software engineering to operations research. And surprisingly, this is actually something that has not been happening uh, to any significant scale in normal day-to-day -day operations research at other companies. And several people I've talked to who've been, who have been working on supply chain optimization at other companies were actually surprised that we thought of this at all. Um, again, the kind of the normal approach, well, while supply chain optimization is less Excel bound, it still has a lot of sort of one-off scripts in MATLAB or Python, which get turned by email and sort of copied, pasted, and modified. So we're really hoping to create an alternative to that that helps us manage and scale more complex systems. Okay, so what does a Haskell framework get us? I mean, the biggest thing is it gets us types and abstractions that naturally push code to be modular and help us combine disparate pieces in ways that are all, always compatible. Another thing that uh, I really like doing is being able to separate out the actual model from the way we solve it. And more importantly, I would really love to separate out uh, a sort of idealized model of the world from the model with approximations we need to actually make it tractable. Now, there are kind of two ways to attack a problem which is too large to solve directly. One of those is to take your model and simplify it, add a whole bunch of assumptions, but then you know, uh, get to a place that you can solve exactly. And a lot of operations research takes this approach. So if you picked up a supply chain optimization paper, often they could have this string of assumptions that they make, which are generally pretty unrealistic, but then they prove that their solution to this problem is exact. Um, honestly, from a business perspective, having you know, a realistic solution to an unrealistic problem is not, uh, uh, not, that, not that great, but on the flip side, it does give you the advantage of having a system that's easy to reason about so you can understand the properties of the solution and the property, uh, properties of your system. Um, the, first, the, the other option is to write a model with high fidelity that has a lot of details and is too complicated to optimize, and then either uh, approximate it with some general method like reinforcement learning, or perhaps layer on simplification separately. And part of the advantage is, again, purely software engineering. You separate out your assumptions very explicitly, and you still have the original with the semantics you want in a way that you can read and understand. And of course, the practical upshot is that when you go to simulate, you can actually simulate the higher fidelity model and get a good feel empirically about how far your approximation is from uh, the actual system. Um, of course, even, even your high fidelity model is still going to be much simpler than the real world, but this still gives you much better assurance than simply operating on these simplified models directly. Okay, so. We've been at this project for about nine months, and a lot of that was spent in preliminary research. So while I'll give you some quick experience reports, this is still a very new, new thing, and we're still kind of getting through the initial teething phase, uh, phases. So one thing we, I found, and I was really surprised by it, is just how well simple abstractions scale. Because some of the things we're using, um, if, you, if you took a seasoned software engineer and you pointed it to them, they'd say, well, this is exponential, this is terrible, it'll never work. Or this is quadratic, this is terrible, it'll never work. But it turns out that these things do work, and sometimes they work longer than you'd expect. Now, the first example is this discrete probability monad I mentioned. Uh, as it happens, if you try to take this approach of calculating the entire uh, final solution exhaustively, and you have more than like, uh, let's say 10 random variables, it's going to take forever. And so for a lot of applications, this is hilariously, uh, hilariously impractical. But for us at Target, we managed to dodge this largely because um, most of our models only have one or two random variables, uh, in large part because, as I mentioned, the optimization phase is already very hard. So even if you could calculate the distribution for something with 10 random variables, you probably couldn't optimize it anyway. So uh, I'll be fair. We kind of got lucky on that one. And the fact that we're still using this really inefficient representation uh, is not a very generalizable idea. But as I mentioned, there's been a lot of research on how to take exactly the same style of programming and do it a lot more efficiently. So in the future, when we really start running into a lot of these limitations, we'll be able to take this um, more sophisticated approach, in this case, using a free monad, and just substitute it directly into all the code we've written, because it's all written against an abstract monadic interface. Now, another package uh, that we found surprisingly useful is the memo try package. And this package just gives you combinators that let you automatically memoize functions. 
And so instead of writing a lot of our dynamic programming manually, we've just shoveled a bunch of memo tries everywhere. And if you look at the library with your sort of performance engineer hat on, you'll kind of uh, you'll just be completely revolts because the constant factors are gigantic. But it turns out that this really hasn't ever been our bottleneck. We've done a bunch of benchmarks, and while it's certainly a lot slower than a mutable array, it's still more than fast enough for everything we've thrown at it. And more importantly, it's just far easier to write code with memo tries than it is to write code with explicit dynamic programming. There's fewer places to make mistakes. It fits into normal Haskell. Basically, you just take a function, you tell Haskell to memoize it, and it just works. Um, and another, another thing that I really enjoyed using is the functional graph library. And again, the functional graph library gives us this nice high-level functional interface to talking about graphs. But if you actually try doing heavy-duty graph algorithms with it, the fact that it's persistent, the fact that it has um, a kind of somewhat complex general representation makes it very hard to make those algorithms fast. But again, because our graphs are pretty small, we mostly use the graphs to model the geographic locations of all the nodes in our network. Because these graphs are small, we've gotten pretty far with this. And now, I mean, I'm very confident that if I'm going to start a new project, no matter how strict the performance requirements look, I'm always going to start out with the simplest, most elegant thing possible. And then later, I'll either figure out how to rewrite it, how to substitute it in something more performant, or if things are great, the problem will just go away on its own. And I mean, as, as an engineer, there's little that I like more than problems that just go away. And then finally, I mean, a lot of the optimization algorithms you've been using aren't very sophisticated, but even so, they're better than what we had before, and a lot of them deliver good enough results to be interesting. So simplicity scales more than you'd expect. Now, another thing I found is that types are great for little things. Now, previously I mentioned these sort of long-term goals in terms of developing a framework and making things modular and helping people provide mistakes in domain models, but I think the biggest thing that we've gotten out of types is keeping track of different identifiers. So Target is a legacy, legacy company. It has a lot of old software. So the item database, each item has three identifiers. They don't correspond one to one. Different systems use different ones. And everybody has a lot of fun figuring out which system needs which identifier. Um, in our code, we've prevented a lot of annoying errors just by being very explicit and just using simple new types for each kind of item identifier. Because now we just immediately know from an interface what we need. And we can't ever accidentally pass something in uh, that it isn't expecting. And then an even more, more fun example is that locations, so stores and distribution centers, have two kinds of identifiers, which mostly overlap. And then one of them changes sometimes. And so what we have is kind of like, sometimes if you pass the wrong one, it'll work. And sometimes it won't. And they look identical. So if you were trying to look at debug logs, you just have to memorize all like 3,000 numbers to figure out which ones are right and which ones weren't. Um, now, <laughs> amusingly enough, the people who do a lot of work with specific stores or distribution centers do memorize a whole bunch of these identifiers, but that's not a, not a scalable way to debug code. So for us, again, just having types to differentiate between one kind of location ID from another is just incredibly valuable and saves a lot of time. And then, you know, a, a lot of the other benefits were things like, you know, clear config files and clear inputs and outputs between stages in our data processing pipeline. Just having everything match up at the type level saves a lot of time on testing and debugging. Um, another thing, of course, is that we've used quite a, a, a range of type system extensions in parts of our, uh, our system. And the thing is, they're powerful. And sometimes some extensions are necessary, but there's always a risk. One of the things that I really like about Haskell is that it lets us have types without compromising on expressiveness. But to me, expressiveness is actually the key reason that I mentioned in Haskell. The types are kind of a bonus on top. And the problem is that if you use the wrong extensions, expressiveness goes out the window. I mean, one example is that we had this API, which was made very general. And so it had accepted a function that required some higher rank types, which meant that when you called it, you had to use a, la a Lambda with about eight lines of type signatures for a, a one line body, right? And the other problem was that it made it very difficult to refactor. In normal Haskell, I can go through old code and move things around and reorganize things without even necessarily understanding what's going on. Because there are some simple syntactic rules where I always know that it, it will not change the semantics of the code if I extract an expression into a variable. And it won't change the semantics of the code if I turn something into a function 
or folds a function back into an expression. Now, the problem with uh, some of these extensions that break type inference is that while this might still be true semantically, you have to figure out which things need type signatures when you move things around. And this makes calling your API, and more importantly, it makes refactoring old code a lot harder and uh, less pleasant. And so while in normal Haskell, I always leave code in a better state than I found it, just because refactoring is so easy, as soon as you start using too many uh, type system features injudiciously, this, this whole property kind of disappears. So I think while these extensions have a place, they really have to be used tastefully. And sort of simple types lead to simple APIs, which really helps projects as they scale, especially if you have multiple developers at different experience levels working on the code base. Okay, lenses. So I, th I think this is kind of a controversial, controversial subject sometimes. But I found that lenses are great. And one thing that really makes them more powerful is using them consistently. So in our code base, every single record has lenses defined for its fields. So when I'm using somebody's record, I don't have to think about how to access something. I just always use lens. And this means that pretty much almost every single module imports control.lens. Um, and I'm not convinced that this is the only way to do it. But I think the kind of the two optimal options are either just not using lens or going whole hog. I try this in between thing where you sometimes have lenses, you sometimes don't, and you have to pay attention. That doesn't work very well. And of course, as a nice bonus, until we get to 8.2, you can use lenses and template Haskell to sort of hack around, uh, to have your own hacky version of overloaded record fields, which I mean, when you introduce somebody to Haskell, especially somebody used to doing kind of domain specific ABC code, and you tell them, hey, you can never have two records of the same field name in the same file. Uh, they're never happy. And when you're trying to adapt a JSON API, and the JSON API has three layers, and each layer has the same field, unless you have some facility for making this overlap without using your two prefixes in your field names, I mean, it's a pretty bad experience. And while template Haskell has its own downsides, I think this is a great example of where it's worth setting things up so that you can actually have overlapping field names, and you can actually behave like a same modern language. Now, We've also had some difficulties, and some of these I think are teasing issues, and some of them are because certain things are not um, not really mature in Haskell. So one, one difficulty we've had was with building and deployment. Now we've had a lot of good experiences with Next, but the problem is that while it really solves the fundamental problem well, it's very much an early adopter tool. So I'm at the point where I think it's awesome, but I also think you probably shouldn't use it unless you already know you want to use it. Uh, because if you're willing to understand Nix, it's really powerful. Uh, but unfortunately, if you kind of just want to get along, Nix packages is not really in a state where it's easy for random people to pick up. Now, this, by the way, is an important distinction. Uh, Nix, the package manager, is solid, reliable, and the language it uses is simple. But Nix packages has this large infrastructure written in the Nix language for building all sorts of projects. And that is kind of poorly documented, inconsistent, and hard to understand. And then, of course, things work a lot better on Linux than they do on OS X. And you can see why I'm complaining, right? Because, of course, at Target, all the developers get Macs, and IT doesn't even support Linux for uh, developer workstations. Uh, and then we've also had the classic issues with compile times, which really get in the way of iterating on larger projects. And then we've also had issues with some libraries, like a lot of the networking stack, having weird, hard-to-find hard bugs and not being as well-maintained as their equivalents in, for example, Java or Scala. OK, so I mean, that kind of wraps up the experience uh, we've had on the team. And I, you know, I have to kind of give this final notice that our team is growing now. We've kind of gotten over the initial hump, set things up, and now we're looking to expand. And in particular, we, we, we want somebody who can help us to scale and make our uh, service more robust. And then also, we're always looking for people who have experience with both Haskell and optimization or machine learning. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so that's in data science and system. Is that just like compared to most of the libraries that are like actively delivered in R or Python? Yeah. Have you ran into like library difficulties in R? So, I mean, not in that sense. Um, largely because, and by, by the way, like my job title says data scientist, but in reality, I'm not a data scientist at all, and neither is anybody on my team. Because what <laughs> happens is that data science is kind of, you know, the trendy thing, and operations research is kind of old thing people kind of forgotten about. But what we're doing is almost orthogonal to what a normal data scientist does. 
And what we're doing is literally exactly what operations research people do. Like we are doing straight up operations research, just in the data science group. And as it happens, um, operations research has a lot fewer reusable libraries and kind of the, the tech ecosystem is less developed. And also we kind of had this remit of building a lot of things from the ground up fundamentally and with an eye towards building journal tools. So we haven't run into issues with domain libraries as much, but we have run into issues with incidental things like, you know, hooking to databases, following HDFS. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the like Python Target is doing a lot of work on the supply chain, not just on optimization, but the whole supply chain. So all of this design is kind of up in the air. But right now, we're actually deploying a service that sends orders to move goods around directly. And this is currently only going out to a single test distribution center and a single test store. But ultimately, our model is just plugged directly into Target. And you know, with some intermediaries, we go from the output of our model to a piece of paper out of a printer at the distribution center that somebody's going to pick up scan with their tool and then go and you know fetch the right right um, right product and put it in the right box. So pretty pretty direct to the physical world. Yeah. Um, I mean I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so, so as I mentioned, um, the practical probabilistic programming paper uh, practical probabilistic programming with Modat's paper. Uh, provides a way to embed a probabilistic language a lot like SAM right into Haskell, which makes it easier to work with. But also, one thing that's not clear uh, from, from my size perhaps is that because we're so limited on the optimization side of things, the actual probabilistic models we work with have to be pretty simple. Um, simply because as, as we try to make behavior more complex and more stochastic, it just becomes less and less optimizable. Um, and, and then the other thing is that in practice, it seems that a small small number of sources of randomness dominate everything else. So we don't have to be that sophisticated to go like 90% of the way there. Okay. So in particular, if I understand, kind of follow up on yeah. that, if I understood correctly, the models you have are fully observable. You don't have any event variables. Yes. And that means, and also your rewards are kind of immediately observed when you take an action. Yep. So you don't have to worry about like things, delay things down a lot, just as you do get a lot of Yep. Yep. And I mean, I, I actually wanted to include uh, a concrete example of, uh, of how a system like this looks. I think the slide got left out. But basically, if you just remember the market decision process, uh, we have a set of states. And for a simple inventory control pro problem, this is just the, the inventory. We have actions, and these correspond to making orders. And then all the randomness actually comes from the demand. So you know, we have some inventory, we get some random demand, and then we make an order in response to the demand we've had. Um, and so yeah. The entire state is fully observable, and it's actually pretty simple. It gets more complex as we broaden the system, but I think it's still much simpler than the kind of models people work with in a lot of these sort of statistical disciplines or actual language processing. Yeah. So how is this translating the real world actions? Sure. So I mean, uh, essentially, we just have uh, a server. So as I mentioned, the optimization breaks into two pieces. We have the optimization itself. And then the optimization creates a policy, and the policy is a function. So we actually have a separate service, a server, that takes a policy as an input for the day, then from other target APIs, figures out the state of our inventory, makes a decision based on that, and sends an order to uh, an internal target system that ultimately gets routed to the warehouse management system for the appropriate uh, distribution center. Yes, oh, for sure. I mean, the entire optimization happens completely purely. The policy is designed purely. When we run simulation, it's all pure. The only time we do I.O. is in this server that takes the um, policy, which is just like a serialization of a function. Um, it takes that as input. And then that all kind of finally, once we have this function, uh, coordinates all the inputs we need and figures out where to send the order directly. Uh, no, I mean, right now what we've done is uh, basically taken our Haskell, um, our Haskell code, compiled it statically into uh, a kind of self contained executable, and then we run it on uh, as a Hadoop job on an existing Hadoop cluster. So 
the Haskell code itself isn't managing the distribution. That's just done by existing tools and existing infrastructure. So really, it just kind of runs as a self-contained self executable. Because at this point, an individual optimization model only looks at one item at a time, which means that it runs fine on a single machine. And the distribution is just needed to handle you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of distinct items without much communication between them. Sure. So right now, in our um, starting version of the model, we actually have some domain-specific algorithms where these are the ones I mentioned that you know you have concrete research that says with a set of assumptions, the optimal policy is going to take some parametric form, and you know they've proved how it's optimal. They've shown you how to how to access it. So in our case, we actually just have a, a very compact representation that's specific to the models we're running. Sure, so the question was how long it takes to compute the policy. Um, so as, as, as I mentioned, with, with the particular um, particular domain-specific algorithm we take, it takes like less than a second. Uh, and then with some of the other methods, it really varies depending on a lot of parameters. So we've done some, some experimentation with sort of simulation-based reinforcement learning. And one of the reasons we haven't invested more is just because there are all these extra parameters, which depending on how you change them, radically change how long the system takes to converge. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. That's it.